from the both of us. Thank you so much. This is BBC One in the East. Now the BBC News with Sophie Rayworth and Mosami Bakshi at 10 o'clock. Tonight at 10, a day of reflection and remembrance, a year after the first lockdown was declared across the United Kingdom. Candles lit up doorsteps tonight as people paid their respects to all those who have lost their lives. A minute's silence at midday, frontline workers among the thousands who paused as the Prime Minister thanked people for their response to the virus. For month after month, our collective fight against coronavirus was like fighting in the dark against a callous and invisible enemy until science helped us to turn the lights on and to gain the upper hand. Also on the programme tonight, a £5,000 fine is set to be introduced for anyone in England travelling abroad without a reasonable excuse. Scotland's First Minister survives a vote of no confidence. It comes after a parliamentary committee said she had misled them. Tens of thousands are left homeless after fire sweeps through a vast refugee camp in Bangladesh. And a look back on a year of lockdown for those who were working tirelessly on the front line. Here in the East, one year on, we look back at how three lockdowns have affected this region. And remembering the ones we have lost as we pay tribute to the NHS. Good evening. Lights have shone around the UK tonight in memory of all those who have lost their lives in the past year. Buildings were lit up and people went onto their doorsteps with candles and torches for a moment of reflection on this, the first anniversary of national lockdown. The Prime Minister thanked people for their courage, discipline and patience over the past 12 months, but admitted there were things he wished in retrospect the government had done differently in the early handling of the pandemic. The day of reflection began with a minute's silence at midday. Here's our political editor, Laura Koonsberg. Her report contains flashing images. Time to stop. To remember that harsh first spring. Time to reflect. To contemplate that strange summer. Time to pay tribute to lives lost as autumn turned. Time to mourn those absent now. The slow passing of the seasons, our year-long journey through danger. Now the disease still among us, a second spring. Remembrance in the cabinet room where so many of the decisions were taken too. Then the trio, still at the lecterns. When I asked you to go into lockdown exactly a year ago, it seemed incredible that in the 21st century, this was the only way to fight a new respiratory disease. This was unlike any other struggle in my lifetime, in that our entire population has been engaged. And it's thanks to all of you, therefore, that we can continue on our roadmap to freedom. So much of our routine disappeared indoors. The outside world became a still life we observed. And for more than 100,000 families, it won't be the same again. Well, thank you everyone for coming. I know I haven't been all the way around yet. But when Dean fell ill last March, he and his close family suspected it might be this new strange disease. He had diabetes, but on the 18th of March, he had a sore throat. He was taken to hospital on the 30th of March. His sons weren't worried too much. I'm Oliver and I'm 12 years old. And I'm William and I'm 15 years old. But on the 3rd of April, their dad passed away. He was about to turn 52. I can't remember the last time I saw him because it, before, because he was, when he was ill, he was laying on the couch and I was up in my room playing games as normal. He walked out the door and we didn't, we just thought, oh, we'll be back in a couple of days. We didn't know he was going under, like, into a coma or whatever. We just knew, we just thought, oh, I'll be back in a couple of days. And obviously, 
So that was the last time we ever saw him when he was being wheeled out. As much as sometimes people say that it heals with time, I'm just not sure that's true at the moment. The virus has affected this family in other ways too. Work dried up for Dean's niece and his sister Debbie has had to work and grieve at home. It's the first time I've really heard them talk about it. Um, I mean, my heart breaks for them. As much as they need us, we're there. And as soon as we can actually get together, they're going to get a hug whether they like it or not. <laughs> Oliver. <laughs> After so much sacrifice, today was marked in many ways. Simple spring flowers from the Queen to doctors and nurses at a London hospital. Quiet and distant in the Commons. Silent respect in Cardiff, in Belfast too, and in Edinburgh. I know I will never be able to adequately express the depths of my gratitude for all the sacrifices that have been made by so many. But opposition leaders also wonder about government regrets. We owe both the NHS staff and those on the front line and all the families uh, of those that have died uh, to learn the lessons uh, of the last 12 months, to have an inquiry and to learn what went wrong to make sure that we never repeat that. But in number 10, any reflection yet? If there's one thing you wish you'd done differently in the last year, what would it be? There are probably many things that uh, we wished that we'd known and many things that we wished uh, that uh, we'd done differently at the time in, in retrospect because we were fighting a, a novel uh, disease. The single biggest false assumption uh, that we made was about the potential for asymptomatic transmission. The one thing that I think would have been really important earlier on is to have much better data on what was happening and that would have required testing to be up and ready immediately and it would have required um, the ability to get that information. There was and is still so much that we just don't know. Song and light tonight around the country as the skies darkened, symbols of what's been lost and what's to come. And after a year of pressure behind the country's doors, behind that door, a moment perhaps to share, maybe to ease the heart and hold the memory instead. Sophie, it feels almost eerie to be standing here in exactly the same spot when exactly a year ago we were reporting the Prime Minister's almost unbelievable instruction to the country to sit, stay at home. So much has gone wrong since then. There's been so much pain for thousands of families. But one big thing, of course, has gone right. The vaccine rollout in this country, of course. But in Westminster tonight, there are some raised eyebrows over what the Prime Minister said privately to a group of his own MPs tonight. When those in the room tell me that he said the success of of the vaccine program was down to greed. Now, number 10 didn't want to comment about this, but I'm told that the Prime Minister almost immediately withdrew those remarks. He repeatedly went on to praise the company AstraZeneca, who made the vaccine, repeatedly pointing out that they haven't been making money off doing this, and also even saying to MPs, basically, oh, please forget I said that. It was some kind of misunderstanding. But at the same time, just at the moment when politicians publicly at least on both sides of the channel, are trying to hold nerves steady on the vaccine. It's not the kind of comments that are going to make that any easier. Laura Coonsberg in Westminster, thank you. Well, the UK has seen one of the highest coronavirus death tolls in the world. But this morning, there was encouraging news from the Office for National Statistics. The number of weekly deaths from all causes has fallen below the five-year average for the first time since last August. Our health editor, Hugh Pym, has been looking at the numbers and some of the challenges ahead. The shadow of COVID lingers in every community. The lives lost and livelihoods threatened. And now, a year on, there's increasing understanding of the scale of the impact compared to what was first predicted, with the virus proving far more deadly. A health think tank has calculated that on average those who died with COVID lost up to 10 years of their lives. That's based on life expectancy estimates how long they might have lived. In total, one and a half million years of life have been lost in the UK because of COVID. By comparison, in a bad winter, 250,000 years are lost because of flu and pneumonia. 
It is a devastating bombshell that hit Britain as it hit many other countries. Our loss has been much greater and our loss has been compounded by the underlying health of the population and the disparities between different groups, which COVID has shown most starkly. But numbers are now falling. This line shows the five-year weekly average for deaths from all causes. And this shows what's happened since January last year. There was a big spike above the average in April, mainly because of COVID deaths shown in red. Then another surge from last autumn. But now UK deaths have fallen back below the average for the first time since last summer. The vaccination programme is protecting more people from serious illness and reducing the risk of dying with COVID. But some who've had the virus are still carrying a heavy burden. Come on, Tom! It's a life, but it is not like the life that I was living before. In fact, it's completely different. Tom used to run marathons, but COVID stopped him in his tracks. A year ago this month, he went down with the virus, thought he was recovering, but then couldn't shake off some alarming symptoms. It was the probably the most frightening thing I've ever experienced. Um, it felt like my body had been hijacked by the virus and I didn't understand what was happening and um, no doctor could explain it to me either. Um, Tom has long COVID and says he and many others are still struggling. There's a real lack of um, recognition of the scale of the problem uh, with long COVID. Given that we're just out of the second wave, it's really likely to grow um, over the coming months. And there was a warning today that the virus wouldn't fade away completely. I think the chances of eradicating this disease, which means getting rid of it absolutely everywhere, are as close to zero as makes no difference. We've only achieved eradication of one disease, which is smallpox, with a phenomenally effective vaccine over a very, a very long period of time. The hope is that coronavirus can be kept in check with low levels of hospital cases. But the NHS has a backlog of operations and procedures postponed because of COVID. So the impact of the virus will be felt for some time yet. Hugh Pym, BBC News. Our medical editor, Fergus Walsh, is with me. Interesting hearing the scientists reflecting on what they wish they had known a year ago and also what has changed. Yes, Sophie, a year ago, we didn't know that one in three people with COVID have no symptoms. And that knowledge has informed a lot of public policy, like the wearing of face masks. A year ago, community testing had been abandoned. There was only capacity to do 10,000 COVID tests a day. Now we can do over a million tests a day. Much easier to keep track of outbreaks. The game changer has been vaccines, not one, but several highly effective vaccines. Now, we don't know how long vaccine protection is going to last. It's only 11 months since the first trial started in Europe. They will wane at some point. Then there's this issue of virus mutation. So far, it looks like the current vaccines will protect against severe disease from the virus variants, but may not stop infection. So we may need booster vaccines in the autumn, but scientists are working on those. What's clear is coronavirus is here to stay, and we will see outbreaks like we do with flu, but flu doesn't stop society. And now it is vaccination which is the route out of the pandemic here in the UK, but that also means immunising Europe and the world. Fergus Walsh, thank you. Well, the latest government figures show there were 5,379 new coronavirus infections recorded in the latest 24-hour period, which means on average 5,498 new cases were reported per day in the last week. The latest figures show 5,461 people were in hospital across the UK. 112 deaths were reported in the latest 24-hour period. That's people who've died within 28 days of a positive COVID-19 test. On average, in the past week, 85 deaths were announced every day. The total number is now more than 126,000 people. As for vaccinations, more than 329,000 people have had their first dose of a COVID vaccine in the latest 24-hour period, bringing the total to over 28 million people, more than half of the adult population. And over 2 million people have had both doses of the vaccine now. So how have Scotland, Wales and Northern Ireland fared in the pandemic this past year? And what are the signs for the road ahead? In a moment, we'll hear from our correspondents in Scotland and Northern Ireland. But first to our Wales correspondent, Hal Griffith, with this assessment. 
Over the last 12 months, the Welsh Government's decisions have directly controlled people's lives here far more than ever before. And has done things differently. In October and December, locking down ahead of other parts of the UK. Wales has felt the full force of this pandemic, with some of the highest death rates in Britain in socially deprived areas of the country. But the situation has eased, and today, for the second day in a row, there were no new deaths reported here in Wales. The Welsh Labour government has felt the political heat when it comes to unlocking. It doesn't have a roadmap for easing restrictions over the next few months, something criticised by its opponents in the Senate and likely to be the focus of the elections in May. Here at the Scottish Parliament, politicians have been paying their respects. Nicola Sturgeon said that almost 10,000 people have lost their lives. But the difference this year is that we have a vaccine and around half of the adult population have already had their first dose. Scotland tends to be cautious when it comes to easing coronavirus restrictions. But there is a route map out of this lockdown. The key date is the 26th of April, when the economy will start start to open up. The country is also entering a period of election campaigning. The coronavirus pandemic will feature heavily in that. In Northern Ireland, the pandemic came along just months after the fragile power-sharing government had been newly re-established here following three years of collapse. And immediately, they were faced with a crisis like no other. Tensions and disagreements over lockdowns have often been a feature here. But Northern Ireland also has much to be proud of. The efforts of healthcare workers bringing a sometimes divided place together. The latest frustrations, though, are over the pathway out of all this. Businesses here have no dates to look forward to like they do in some other parts of the UK. And the signs are the executive will continue to be cautious in the days ahead. The unemployment rate stayed broadly stable at 5% between November and January, according to official figures, despite the latest lockdown. The data also shows that younger workers under 25 have been worst affected by job losses since last February, with hospitality and retail hit hardest. From next week, anyone in England trying to travel abroad without a reasonable excuse could be fined up to £5,000. The government says the new laws, which MPs will vote on later this week, are designed to guard against tourists bringing new coronavirus variants back into the country. Today, the Prime Minister said it was too early to say whether foreign holidays will be allowed this summer, but he said rising cases in Europe mean things look difficult for the time being. Caroline Davis reports. Memories of summer holidays past, snapshots of smiles, uh -oh, and small moments of family time together. It's been many months since Dorota's little boy Hugo has seen his grandparents in Poland. We mention Grandpa, Grandma, and the rest of the family, and he just goes quiet and silent and withdraws, and it's, it's worrying me. I think so many of us have valid reasons to to want to go on holiday, um, but you know I do think that there's a difference between uh, going for leisure versus going to, to see your family. But for now, a trip to see grandparents abroad or holidays is still illegal. And from Monday, the government wants anyone travelling abroad without a legally permitted reason to be fined £5,000. The intention is to stop the spread of new cases and variants, which might put the vaccine rollout at risk. The proposed legislation could be in place until the 30th of June, but the government says the timetable it set out in the roadmap last month still stands. When we'll be able to travel again internationally is still not certain. This afternoon, the Prime Minister said that he hoped to have more to say about international travel by the 5th of April. The next important date is the 17th of May. That's the earliest possible date that international travel from England could resume, but there's no guarantee that it won't be pushed back. No date has been set for international travel for Scotland, Wales and Northern Ireland. Some in the industry are frustrated by the announcement. To have these fines come into force now, it's just another blow. You know, if the government wanted these draconian measures, they should have been introduced back when international holidays were first banned. It's just, it's more scaremongering. <laughs> for those hoping to get away, the waiting is difficult, raising their hopes only to reel them back in again in the painful uncertainty of the pandemic. Caroline Davis, BBC News. 
Germany's lockdown is being extended for three weeks amid fears of a third wave of coronavirus sweeping the country. Chancellor Angela Merkel warned Germany was now in a very serious situation. Tough new restrictions are being brought in over the Easter holidays to stop people from travelling within the country, and less than 10% of the population has been vaccinated. From Cuxhaven on Germany's North Sea coast, Jenny Hill sent this report. Not much to look forward to on Germany's north coast. No tourists, no trade. And for the buskers, not much fun. This country was just starting to relax restrictions. Now the shutters are coming back down. We've been left high and dry, Ulrika says. For a year now, says Britta, no gigs, no concerts, no possibility of doing anything. Angela Merkel wanted to lock down harder and faster, but Germany's regional leaders disagreed. At three o'clock in the morning, after 11 hours of fractious talks, she said the situation was very serious. We have now, in fact, a new pandemic. We basically have a new pandemic, she says. The British mutation is now dominant. We're dealing essentially with a new virus, much more deadly, much more infectious. And Germany is vulnerable. Just 9% of the population has received a first dose of vaccine. At the country's biggest vaccination center in Bremen, they could jab 14,000 people a day. They've only got enough vaccine for 2,000. It's frustrating. We want to vaccinate much, much faster. We want to fight the pandemic. People want to be vaccinated. Most people say we're up for it and we can't offer them anything. But now they worry people won't want the AstraZeneca jab, which was temporarily suspended last week. They've had just a handful of cancellations so far. Though this couple, who just had the BioNTech jab, told us they wouldn't have agreed to AstraZeneca. For now, Easter is all but cancelled. And for resorts like Cuxhaven, insults added to injury. Germans can currently fly to Mallorca, where infection rates are low, but a holiday at home is out of bounds. It's utterly incomprehensible. People can go to Mallorca, mix with other Europeans and risk bringing infection back to Germany. It's completely the wrong decision made in Berlin. You can't tell people they can go to Mallorca, but they can't come to Cuxhaven. Politicians here like to talk about fighting the common enemy, the virus. But Europe's bickering over vaccines, Germany over lockdown restrictions. No wonder, perhaps, people are getting fed up. It's an election year here. That frustration could yet have far-reaching consequences. Jenny Hill, BBC News, Cuxhaven. Scotland's First Minister Nicola Sturgeon has won a vote of no confidence in the Holyrood Parliament with a convincing majority. A report published this morning accused her of misleading a parliamentary committee looking into her handling of sexual harassment allegations made against her predecessor, Alex Salmond. But a separate independent inquiry yesterday cleared Nicola Sturgeon of breaking the ministerial code. Our Scotland editor, Sarah Smith, has this report. Cleared by an independent inquiry yesterday, today Nicola Sturgeon has been found to have misled a Holyrood committee and faced a vote of no confidence. No First Minister who truly wanted to live up to the ideals of this Parliament should feel able to continue in post after having been judged guilty of misleading it. How can Parliament have confidence in the words of a First Minister whose words have been found to be false? If you think you can bully me out of office, you are mistaken and you misjudge me. If you want to remove me as First Minister, do it in an election. She comfortably won the vote, but the report from this Holyrood committee may be an ongoing problem. The report finds that the two women who made complaints against Alex Salmond were badly failed by the seriously flawed way the Scottish Government investigated their claims. But the MSPs on the committee couldn't agree on Nicola Sturgeon's role. They split along party political lines, with the SNP members voting against the parts of the report that criticised the First Minister. I will tell, tell the, the truth, truth, the whole oh. truth, and nothing but the truth. Nicola Sturgeon and Alex Salmond gave conflicting evidence to the committee. She firmly denies his claim that she offered to intervene in the harassment investigation. The report says her evidence is an inaccurate account of what happened and that she has misled the committee. 
It also says it was inappropriate for her to continue meeting Mr. Salmon during the investigation and that it's hard to believe Nicola Sturgeon didn't know of concerns about inappropriate behaviour on the part of Alex Salmon prior to November 2017. It's a shame that a committee report of this nature has become tainted by very obvious political bias along party lines and some conclusions. But actually where there are reflections, and the government has always said, we made mistakes uh, when it comes to the implementation of the procedure, looking at complaints into Alex Salmon. To suggest that the committee is partisan when you had united an independent, a Labour member, a Conservative member, you know, a Liberal Democrat, I think the truth is that the members of the SNP were never going to be criticising a First Minister from their own party, whatever evidence we took. Nicola Sturgeon will remain as First Minister for another six weeks at least. On May the 6th, it's up to the voters to decide if she should remain in office. With an election so close, it's unlikely this row is over yet. Sarah Smith, BBC News, Edinburgh. At least 15 people have died and hundreds more are missing after a fire broke out at a large refugee camp in Bangladesh. Tens of thousands of Rohingya Muslims who had fled persecution in neighbouring Myanmar are now homeless. The authorities in Bangladesh say they have begun an investigation into how the fire started at the camp in Cox's Bazaar. Our South Asia correspondent Rajini Vaidanathan reports. Each pillar marks out what was once a makeshift hut. These smouldering remains are all that's left for thousands of refugees. This cramped and congested camp now reduced to ash. Zubeda Begum lost her home in the fire. My two sons are missing. I'm looking for them everywhere, she said. The massive fire started in one section of the settlement on Monday afternoon, but soon spread, destroying homes, schools and hospitals. Refugees ran for their lives. Rohingya Muslims who fled a military crackdown in their home Myanmar more than three years ago, once again on the move. Jahanara has been searching the camps with one of her sons, trying to find six-year-old Muhammad, who's not been seen since the fire broke out. I don't know whether he's dead or alive, she said. Please, God, help me find my son. I just want him back. Close to a million Rohingyas live in the world's largest refugee camp. Already in dire poverty, they're once again struggling to survive. Aid groups say more than 45,000 refugees have now been left homeless. Well, I think the fire is a continued symptom of the larger deterioration within the camps. Um, it's three years on. This is a protracted refugee crisis. Um, obviously, a, a failure of the international community to find a solution. With the ongoing military coup in Myanmar, Rohingya refugees can't go home anytime soon. With their temporary homes now destroyed, their life in limbo continues. Eugenie Vaidinarvan, BBC News, Delhi. A group of former trade unionists, including the actor Ricky Tomlinson, have won a 47-year-long battle to clear their names after being convicted of illegal strike action. The Court of Appeal quashed the convictions after hearing that police had destroyed evidence which should have been part of the original prosecutions. Prince Harry has a new job at a professional coaching firm in the United States. Better Up offers counselling, mentorship and careers guidance. And the Duke of Sussex said his aim was to foster an environment for honest and vulnerable conversations around mental health. Riot police in Bristol have moved in on around 200 protesters who are demonstrating against rent prices. There were scuffles tonight as they were moved on. It comes after a protest on Sunday over reforms to a new policing law led to violence in the city. And tributes have been paid to the former England striker Frank Worthington, who has died at the age of 72 after a long illness. During his career, Worthington made more than 200 appearances for Leicester City. And we finish tonight on this day of reflection with four staff from University Hospital Southampton who have spent the year on the front line. They explain the impact of the last 12 months on their professional and personal lives. There were some days when you had to verify death after death and it was really hard to detach from it. I have had...
had a lot of mum guilt and a lot of professional guilt. The doctors told my family that I have only 40% chances of survival. COVID has taught me to be more supportive with each other and kindness, kindness, kindness. For me. A year of high stress. Every patient that comes through the door, you don't know how they're going to be and how quickly they're going to deteriorate. And then come home at the, at the end of a 14 hour day and wait. No, don't touch me, don't hug me to the people that you just want to melt into because you've got to go upstairs and scrub your body. Oh, we come in to sit with me. Okay, we'll do it together. Come on then. The children would get into the habit of then asking me, is it safe to cuddle you, mummy? 48, 50. Being made to start in the middle of a pandemic and having to learn on the job and having to adapt to a new city and a new culture, that's taught me so much and I've learned so quickly. Do you know why you're in hospital? COVID. Yeah, COVID. We had 15 deaths in two weeks. We would normally have maybe five in a year. So for the team, that is quite hard. Uh, are you allergic to anything? I was tested positive for COVID-19. It was a very weird experience when the ambulance took me to my own workplace and my own work colleagues were looking after me. And I had way much more chances to leave the hospital in a body bag rather than on my own feet. My little soldier, because he's been through the wars. My most challenging moments are in my social life. Personal life. Does it still smell? Yeah. Want to be Because at work you put on that uniform, you have that oh, persona. Okay, yeah. The fact that I've got Keep links with the COVID well. patients, I've kept away from everybody. My husband's had to sit and just hold me while I cry and worry. And I don't normally do that. I normally just come home and I come home to my babies and we live our life to the full. I live alone, so it's still just me thinking about work. It's difficult not having the support of my family members, but it's quite hard to detach and get on with my life just at home before you go back to work and do the same thing again. I decided to stand up from the wheelchair and to salute them as a sign of gratitude towards everything that they have done for me and my family. Go. I took proper time to chat with as many people as possible. I have started to show when I'm not okay. I don't think I've had any choice but to stand up and say I haven't been okay. We all need to look for support and, and if you can't get it face to face with your family, you need to look at other areas. I just try to speak to someone, tell them how I'm feeling, you know, do a workout, try to do some mindfulness. What I'm looking forward to most is developing a social life. Oh. I think for every mum, dad, human being, we need to start getting back to normality. I'm looking forward to going to see my family and having a cup of tea with my mum out of my special mug. We are not dreaming of sandy beaches. We just really want to see our family and our parents. I can't wait to hug. Can't wait to hug my family. Reflections from the front line on this day of remembrance. And that's it from us. Good night. Hello and welcome to a special Looky Slate News.